otherwise um i will hand over to you mick thank you thanks very much amber and thanks very much eureka for uh uh, writing the essay, which by the way everyone is up on the um, art school, after all art school site. Um, if you haven't read it, I really suggest uh, going back into the site and having a look. Which by the way everyone is up on the um, art school, after all art school site. That's me again. I'm not um, anyway, to um, Eureka, could you put the first um the, the the image of the la vie guillard up is it yes that's great thank you so we're, we're discussing this painting um which is by adelaide la vie guillard it's called self-portrait with two pupils it's painted in 1785 it's four years by the way it means four years before the revolution so um, the Ancien Regime is still in power. Uh, it's a big painting. It's uh, two meters ten by one meter fifty one. Um, so it's a real full figure painting, and um, it's a self portrait. That's La Bie Guillard, who's uh, sitting uh, at the easel, presumably painting you, the spectator. Um, she's dressed very. Uh, finely in the fashion of the day. And behind her is um, two pupils. On the right is Ma uh, Marie-Gabrielle Capet, who we'll hear quite a lot about, I think, later in this conversation. And on the left is uh, Marie-Marguerite uh, Caro, who I think unfortunately died about three years after this painting was, was finished. So, they're her pupils, um, but I think we can say as well, and, well, we can say because Eureka has told us that these, these women, um, they had a great friendship as well. They, they were very entwined in each other's lives. So it's a self-portrait as her as an artist, um, as a teacher, um, and also uh, it's, it's, a, it's a portrait of companionship as well. And it's, it very much addresses uh, notions of femininity in relationship to the states of women artists at the time. Um, La Bie Guillard um, can be said to be very much someone who, uh, well, a woman who achieved great recognition in her life under the Ancien Regime. And Eureka is going to talk about that, I, I think. Um, but she also uh, advocated for um, uh, the rights of women to to be taught, um, uh, to be to be uh, become artists as well, uh, uh, post revolution. Um, so, what else can we say? At the time, this painting had an enthusiastic reception, and it it really uh, beckoned in a number of uh, portrait commissions, royal portrait commissions. Um, but the painting soon fell into an obscurity, especially in France, uh, which we can say went on to enter the collection of the Met in New York in about 1953. Um, this painting's got a lot of context behind it and the uh, limitations of uh, we asked uh, of Eureka um, meant that she couldn't really expand so much on those on that context. So um, I wonder, Eureka, can you talk a little bit more about the context of the Ancien Regime um, mm -hmm. in terms of this painting and, and La Bie Guillard, first of all? Yeah, thank you, Mick. So this is a painting that is. Um, well, I guess the, the first thing to sort of understand about its context is, of course, the fact that it is by a woman artist. It's by an artist who really, I would say, kind of specifically and prominently is highlighting her femininity in this work um, by presenting herself in this really sumptuous dress, you know, glistening satin, a very elaborate hat, certainly nothing that would be worn by a male artist, um, one of her contemporaries. 
Um, and I think that she, this artist is having to really craft herself as a portraitist, but also as a woman artist in particular, because of the context of the Ancien Regime uh, that she's working in. So that's something really important to understand. Um, She's working at a time when women were not really allowed to um, pursue art in a professional sense. So to earn their living um, by being artists. Uh, the governing body for art in France at this time was the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, the a Academy Royale de Peinture et de Sculpture. And basically this was the sort of institution that kind of set the rise and fall of artistic careers by um, governing training commissions and access to the public via the salon, so-called salon exhibitions. Salon, the salon exhibitions were held every two years in the, what was then the Louvre Palace, today the Musée du Louvre, and one had to be a member of the Royal Academy in order to exhibit in the Salon. Now, at a certain point, um, the governors of the Royal Academy took the decision to limit the number of artists that were allowed to be members to four. And La Biguillard, um, a couple of years before painting this work, became one of them. So in 1783, she was admitted to the Royal Academy, but um, she was basically the you know, last woman that was allowed in because there were um, two other women, um, a flower painter and a, um, a landscape artist, and then um, another portraitist named Elisabeth Louise Vigée Le Crown was admitted the same year, the same time as La Biguillard, and that was kind of it. So for, uh, for La Biguillard, um, in terms of you know, her identity, um, she was always kind of forced to mediate this role of being you know, both a clearly very talented practicing artist, but then also a woman in the public sphere. And the other artist that she was really kind of pitted against, competing against, was the woman shown here in two self-portraits, uh, Elisabeth Louise Vigée Le Brun. She was the person who was admitted also in 1783 at the same time as La Biguillard. And I think that that context of the sort of professional rivalry between these two women, um, as well as the kind of restrictions placed on women within the larger context of the Royal Academy, uh, really do kind of create a context that's interesting in which to think about La Biguillard's self-portrait. And uh, Vigée Lebrun um, was the portraitist to Marie Antoinette. Exactly. Uh, Vigée and Lebrun um, quickly established a reputation for herself as um, the kind of go-to portraitist for society women in Paris specifically of a certain class. So quite aristocratic and um, with time developed a very close relationship with Marie Antoinette, um, as well as um, you know, being kind of known for sort of portraying women at their best. Um, you know, not exactly flattering them, but sort of flattering them. Um, known for being very beautiful herself, um, something that she certainly played up in her self-portraits. Um, and known for, um, you know, if you wanted a beautiful portrait, she was the person to go to. And I think that Le Biguillard in painting herself, uh, certainly in such a sumptuous dress with this idea of, you know, femininity kind of so highlighted, I do think that that relationship and that kind of um, need to maybe show that she too, um, you know, was, was able to own her identity as a woman, as well as be, you know, this prominent artist. I think that that is present in her mind as she's making this work. And she, she, she was noted for the way she depicted um, the dress of her sitters, um, which is another reference, presumably, to her 
put to her own um, dress in the portrait. Yeah. Do you want, sorry. No, no, please. Her, her big patron was Madame uh, Adelaide. Yes. Um, so following the success of this work, uh, the Metropolitan Museum Portrait, um, and I'm showing here a preparatory drawing for that uh, painting, which we can discuss um, maybe in a moment. Um, but following the resounding success of the, the Met painting in 1785 at the Salon, um, Leibig acquired her own sort of patron. So Vigée de Prome had Marie Antoinette and La Guillard became very close to Madame Adelaide, who was the aunt to Louis the 16th. So the daughter of Louis the 15th. And Madame Adelaide and her sister, Madame Victoire, were um, really kind of interested patrons of the arts in their own right and had their own, you know, almost court, if you will, um, at Versailles. And so um, Adelaide supposedly liked the 1785 painting that's now in the Met so much that she offered to buy it for a really kind of phenomenal sum of money. Um, La Biguillard chose to keep the painting, that painting with her, but she did take on several other commissions from Madame Adelaide, including the work shown here. Um, so this is a portrait of Madame Adelaide. The, um, Vigée, uh, sorry, La Biguillard made three versions of it, the one of which is in Versailles, and then two of them have ended up in the United States, one of them is the Speed Art Museum, and so that's what I'm showing here. Um, so this is a sort of core portrait of Madame Adelaide. Again, you know, great attention to this very sumptuous dress, as you can see, um, but also kind of coding a lot of iconography about Madame Adelaide's place in court and her relationship with her father, um, and her kind of role as the daughter of France, which is um, sort of the official title given to um, an unmarried daughter of a king of France. So if we go back to the previous slide, um, uh, the one, one before that, sorry, yes. of that one. Um, so we've got a, so Le Biguia, she's, she's painting in 1785, two years before she's been Received into the Academy Royale. Um, two years sorry. Sorry. It's two years after. Sorry. Two years after. Okay. And um, she's she's just about to uh, sur surf a, a wave of success. Mm -hmm. And but we've got her two uh, pupils in the background, uh, Carol and Ca uh, Cape. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I mean, it's, it's interesting here that the, the, the studio's somehow in obscurity, it gets lost in the chiaroscuro. We're kind of aware it's a studio, but it's, um, but I wonder, do you want to talk a little bit more about Cape and... Um, yeah, uh, so I find, I mean, the painting is so interesting. Um, you were mentioning the sort of studio in obscurity and actually, I was just thinking in comparison with the portrait of Madame Adelaide that I was just showing, it really is interesting to see how she is creating the sense of a very, um, you know, more bourgeois interior as opposed to the court interior of the portrait of Madame Adelaide. But um, in, in this painting, I think, you know, as you said, this is a work that is so much about, it's about her as an artist, but it's also really about these students that she had very close relationships with. Um, La Biguillard was known um, already at this time for taking on young women um, as students and for really kind of fostering their careers. Um, and some of them actually ended up coming to live with her. Um, and so she was sort of known for um, really um, mothering them, you know, and sort of bringing them up. Um, both of the women shown here in question were very close to her. Uh, both of them lived with her for a while. Um, Kerho left to be married um, and then died in childbirth, as you said, quite young. Um, but Kepe remained the companion, um, really close friend of La Biquiar for, you know, the next 20 years. So this painting also sort of um, 
visualize as the start of this really important relationship for the two women. And I think the role that they play in this painting, I find so interesting because you have, um, you have one of them, um, Kerho, who's shown on the, um, on the left, um, looking out at the viewer. And that's something that, you know, of course the viewer in this case, as, as you said in your introduction, the viewer is also kind of the person potentially that's being painted, we can imagine, because Le Biguiar was known as a portraitist. Um, so presumably one would be in her studio sitting in front of her easel to be painted. And so there's this real sense of, you know, she's watching the spectator, she's watching you. Um, and then you have Capet who's looking at the painting on the easel with such an enthusiastic, you know, sort of absorbed look. And I think that's really wonderful too. And it kind of, um, because La Biguiar chooses not to have us see what she's painting, what's on the, what's on her easel, she, um, in a way, Cape is the stand-in for us. You know, she is the one who is looking and because she seems to think this is so wonderful, she's so interested in what she's seeing, um, it kind of gives us the cue that there must be something pretty, pretty great going on. Um, and of course, the other thing that I, I find really wonderful in this painting is that La Biguillard, if she wanted to, she would show us what was on the easel. And we can kind of pick that up in just the sort of degree of detail that she uses to render the back of the canvas, you know, the way in which the, it's tacked on um, to the stretcher, you know, you, you feel the tension of the material, you see the, um, the nails um, that are attaching the, the material to the wood. Um, so clearly she'd be very capable of painting another composition if she wanted to. But I, I think the way she sets up this relationship of, of different looks and gazes is also, you know, just as powerful. It's, it's, it's a very complex uh, dispositive in that sense. And yes. we'll get to another painting where I think, I think is a, in parallel has a kind of reversal of most of these things, and an equally complex uh, mechanism. But it, before we get to that, I mean, it's, it's worth saying that as you were telling me previously, you've got a, a pastel uh, study um, on the right here of uh, Café mm -hmm. and Carol. Yeah. And uh, La Biguiar uh, Bigu is painting an oil painting. We, we very well, for sure, she's painting an oil painting. And that as well, within this kind of the hierarchies which some women were breaking through was very important. The fact she was, she yeah. was excelling in, in oil painting. Yeah, I think that um, she, so she started off as a pastelist um, and her first teacher was a specialist in pastels. And she ended up coming to oil painting a bit later when she started studying with the son of her first teacher who eventually became her husband, um, François-André Vincent, a major painter in his own right. Um, and I think there definitely at this time period, there was a hierarchy of techniques, um, you know, fair or not. And pastel was very much associated with a sort of more feminine practice in terms of making art. So in kind of making that jump um, to being a oil painter, um, I think um, La Biguiar is, is telling us something about her ambition. And then, you know, to make such a massive painting, you know, seven foot high painting, um, again, that's, you know, clearly quite a feat. Um, if for nothing else, then it shows she has a huge studio in which she's able to work on a painting like this. Um, and the money to buy pigments. Um, but it is interesting that she uses the, she, she's still relying on her practice as a pastelist to sort of build up the painting so that she is really working out the likenesses of these two women um, through pastel. Um, and it's also interesting because it, it really makes clear to us, you know, knowing that this is part of her practice, it, it sort of reaffirms that she is determined to capture the exact likenesses, the, the, the portraits of these students. So they're not meant to be just kind of 
you know, allegorical students, oh, a reference to the fact that she has some female students. They're meant to be specific individuals because generally speaking, um, portraitists did, well, often in the 18th century, portraitists did begin with pastel to start, um, you know, making, to, to really work out a likeness. And that's clearly something that she's trying to do here. Should we um, move on? Because yeah, so we've got 1785. Um, everyone's on a roll here. It's pre mm -hmm. pre revolution, and then in 1808, uh, Capet paints a painting called Portrait of the Late Madame Vincent, um, which is an extraordinary juxtaposition of the two paintings. So this is painted what, uh, 19 years after the revolution, it's painted five years after La Bille Guillard's death. Um, and could you tell, I mean, there's a lot in this painting. Yeah. And well, I'd, I'd just like to say the reversals though are quite extraordinary. No, because La Bille Guillard is at the easel. Capet is next to her, assisting her. Yeah. Uh, 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 Guia is painting Vien, who was a great teacher of David and also Vincent, who is her husband, who's behind her. But I mean, I think you should fill yeah. this in. This is incredibly rich painting, isn't it? It's a wonderful work. And it's, I think it was really meant to serve as a pendant to the Met picture. And I say that because the, um, because La Guillard actually kept the painting that's now in the Met, the 1785 painting, she kept it with her for, you know, her entire life. It remained with her in her studio. Um, as I said, she had the option to sell it and she didn't. And so when, and when she died, Vincent, who was her husband, um, inherited, you know, everything. And Capet, who had been living with Vincent and La Biguiar, kind of as their daughter at this point, um, she, Capet stayed on to take care of Vincent, who she called, she literally called him father. And so of course, when she's making this work, therefore, even though La Biguiar has died, she's still in the space and has access to the Metropolitan Museum painting. So I, I do think it's very plausible to say that she makes this work as a sort of direct response to, um, to the 1785 portrait. And I think, you know, as you say, there are so many interesting kind of parallels and counterpoints in this work. So uh, La Biguillard is a woman shown in white, um, sitting and painting at her easel. Again, we don't see what she's painting. Um, and Vincent is the figure standing behind her with a dark coat on, uh, pointing at something on the easel. And of course, you know, for everybody that knew them, they, um, he had been her teacher, but then also, you know, kind of worked alongside of her as a colleague um, for the majority of their time together. Um, and the person that La Biguillard is painting as a portraitist, now, you know, kind of a well-established portraitist in her own right, is Vincent's teacher, Vian. So that's, you know, kind of, I think, a really interesting relationship. Um, and then the person who is looking out at us you know, is now Capet, who of course in La Biguillard's painting is shown looking so intently absorbed in what's on the easel. And Capet, who had studied with La Biguillard and really um, done some work in oil painting, but largely remained a specialist of pastel, um, in this instance is shown holding a loaded palette and a brush um, ready for La Biguillard, but she's also holding it, you know, sort of, she's an artist herself. Um, maybe she's prepared the palette. Um, so, and, and of course this painting is made in oil. So I think that there's, again, a sort of interesting, um, there's something interesting going on. Um, and then finally, this painting, uh, Capet made portraits of, uh, recognizable portraits of many of the leading artists of the day, all of whom were friends um, and, you know, kind of in a, um, in a, all part of the same society as 
uh, La Bigiar, Vincent, and Capet. Um, so for instance, um, the young man standing behind Villam is his son, um, another artist, and then um, standing next to his wife, um, who is a classicist. There are several um, and recognizable portraits of artists um, in the background, uh, young up and coming history painters. Basically, um, the point is that La Bigiar's studio, as represented by Capet, is the sort of gathering place for um, the most exciting painters of the day in 1808. So it's a really powerful statement of friendship, I think, of artistry, of the sense of sociability and the kind of new society that is um, running the art world um, at this point. Um, you know, after the revolution. So it's, um, it, as you say, it's a very rich painting. There's also a massively political thing going on here, isn't there, that uh, I think you could probably expand on. The, the uh, Vincent was uh, a student of Vian. I think behind him are some of his students, is that right? Mm. Um, is so, right? yes. Um, so there is, um, so Vincent was a student of Vian, as was, of course, another major figure um, in the French art world, um, Jacques Louis David. And I think that there is, so of course, for those, you know, as all of these artists, for those who are familiar with the history of France and what happened during the revolution, um, they would have known that, um, La Biguillard and her husband Vincent ended up both the, really supporting the idea of a constitutional monarchy. Um, so on the side of revolution initially, but a sort of more um, kind of moderate um, uh, political stance um, than that taken by David, um, who um, you know ultimately became responsible for persecuting artists that he felt did not really embrace revolutionary politics at a certain point. And um, that included uh, Vincent and La Biguillard, both of whom um, fled Paris during the terror. And um, so I think that in representing the sort of continued proximity with Vian, um, who was the teacher of both of them, I think that there is, um, I agree that there is um, a a statement. There's also um, Cape putting La Biguia at the center of this painting. Uh, it, it kind of it's trying to disrupt a hierarchy as well. Is, 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 could one say mm -hmm. that? Yes, that it's a woman, um, a woman artist, a woman's studio that's brought everyone together, um, and really, and and in a way. Um, it has been said, um, Laura Arricchio, who wrote what is to this day the only monograph in English on La Biguillard, um, she interprets this painting in a slightly sad way because she, because she makes the point that La Biguillard essentially was the only woman portraitist operating in Paris at this time in 1808. And you know that, and so in her mind, Capet is sort of making that statement that there really was no one else, no one to sort of take her place. Um, and in a way, you know, even though um, I think that the rivalry that was really set up between La Biguillard and Vigée de Prime, you know, there are sexist sort of um, undertones to pitting these two very successful women against each other. Um, in a way, I guess, making the statement that there was, I mean, there were two women before the, um, at the end of the Ancien Regime, and then there's only one, you know, really, who's um, and now gone um, by the time this painting is made. There was a commitment to teaching by uh, Guillaume as well, because uh, Vichy Lebrun said that she wasn't interested in teaching. Uh, there was always a commitment to teaching by Guillaume, and she really argued pre and post revolution that women should be accepted accepted into the academy. So she was a real yeah. advocate. Yes, yeah, she, she, she certainly was. And um, 
at a certain point tried to obtain official official lodging in the Louvre, uh, which as I mentioned was the site for the Salon exhibition. Um, this is pre the Musée du Louvre when it was still a royal palace. And um, artists were, you know, as sort of a benefit to members of the Royal Academy. Um, artists were given free studio space and an apartment um, in the Louvre and La Biguillard asked to have one um, and was turned down because the thought was that she was going to be bringing in a lot of young women students and that would distract the men uh, from their studies. So I think from pretty early on, uh, definitely from the 1780s, she was very much associated, her reputation and the kind of <laughs> professional identity that she constructed was also predicated on being a teacher of specifically women. Whereas Lebi Guillard um, in her memoirs wrote that she didn't really enjoy teaching. Um, now, whether that's a construct or not, you know. You Vijay Lebrun. Oh, sorry, Vijay Lebrun, yes, sorry. I uh, wrote that she didn't really enjoy teaching, um, which, you know, I mean, who knows? Um, but it was it was the way she liked to portray herself that she you know was kind of didn't have time for um, for, for students. These two paintings ever been shown together? Um, that I don't believe. No, I, I don't believe they have. Um, I think at, there will be, or there you know pre pre COVID, there have been um, plans to have a, a, mon a monographic exhibition on Levi Guiar, who is definitely long overdue for, um, for, for, an, uh, for an exhibition. And maybe that will be the occasion to, sh to borrow this painting. It certainly would be wonderful. Because the reverse is extraordinary in the sense that you see uh, Guiar painting the sitter, who is you in her portrait and the reversal of the gazes of Cafe um, in the two paintings as well. It's, it's a really complex, extraordinary knit. Mm -hmm. I've got a question actually, which relates to this. Uh, you, you okay for a question, Eureka? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee. It, say, it says, I'm wondering about the gaze of Cafe towards the viewer, which is in her painting, which seems to reflect uh, Caro de Rosamond in the 1785 painting. Mm. Is there anything? No, that's an interesting, um, that's a really interesting point. I agree, there's something very steady and gentle in the, I mean, that's very striking in the way in which uh, Cape is looking out at the viewer. Um, you know, I don't know if, since sadly Cape didn't leave any writings to talk about her rationale for plotting out this work, I don't know, but it is a fact, you know, as I said, that she had the La Biguiar painting, um, you know, had access to it while she was making this. So you could definitely imagine that she constructed this painting in the sort of very, um, where each of the figures is meant to have a counterpoint. I think that that's a good point. Is there, I mean, within the, the wider context, because the, the thing when I was looking at this painting, I had to remind myself was uh, Guia is a, is a contemporary of Fragonard, Greuze. Uh, she would have, I mean, you know, she would live, be living at the time of Diderot's critiques of the Salon, etc. And, you know, with this question about the gaze of Cafe, mm. um, in, in the, the, the Griar painting, it's, as you said, you use the word, it's absorbative. Mm. Uh, the, the, the characters absorbed in the painting is, is not um, conscious as a viewer. Um, and then in each painting though, we've got the address to the spectator. I mean, these mechanisms of address, um, I mean, this is more of a general question, I think. Um, could you say more about that? It's, it's, mm -hmm. so I know that you've done a lot of work on Greuze, for example. And oh. <laughs> real mechanism of yes. um, Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a real desire um, in both this picture and Capet's painting to construct a narrative. And 
to, you know, to make the viewer feel that they're participating in some kind of story. Now we don't necessarily know what, but the gazes do kind of give some clue. Who's looking at what, where they're looking. Um, our gaze for each of the paintings moves around, um, moves around the composition because of where we see people looking. Um, definitely in this one where there are so many people, I think that's the case, but also in the larger Met picture where it's more stark because it's you know so concentrated, just the three of them. And I think that that's actually, you know, it's a mechanism that for me is designed to elevate these works from portraiture, which was a, um, so in basically sort of the history of Western art um, and sort of this specifically came to the fore in France in the 17th century and then the 18th century, there was a very strict hierarchy of genres so-called. Um, history painting at the top, followed by portraiture, landscape, flower, uh, flower painting, still life. Um, and so one status within the Royal Academy, but also, you know, where one was exhibited, um, what kind of commissions you received, all of that was dictated by where you fell in the hierarchy of genres. Um, now, both Lebi Guillard and Capet were portraitists. They were, you know, that's an extremely noble um, discipline. Um, obviously, as we said, Lebi Guillard made a great living off of it um, pre revolution. But there always is, I think, on the part of any ambitious painter working in this structure in the late 18th century, the desire to, you know, slightly elevate oneself to history painting. And history painting basically, um, the, by, by definition, it's recounting a biblical, um, classical, you know, mythological narrative. So there's some kind of story and it's meant to convey the story to the viewers and um, basically inspire the viewer um, as a result. And, you know, so I think that by sort of subtly introducing these narrative elements into their works, uh, we're seeing these artists also show off their chops as sort of history painters, because of course, you know, you do, when you look at a painting like this, you do feel that there's something going on. There's, you're trying, part of the interest of the work, you know, it's the size, it's the beauty of the technique, um, but it's also what is on the easel. What is she painting? What is she looking at? You know, why is this one woman looking out at us? And, and so I think that there's, um, yeah, I think, I think there's a strong narrative element to both. Um, and then certainly in the cafe, um, as well, I think that the, the direction of the gazes is so fascinating and, you know, these sort of different groups of individuals and, um, you know, as we were saying, the fact that Capet is the one looking out and, you know, so there's, yeah, a lot going on. Um, there's three questions coming, actually three from Alison. The first one is very, very interesting. Um, can you talk more about the what the teaching was like in the time span? Was the teaching of pupils in this way small numbers working in the household of an artist, or I presume in the, in the atelier of an artist? Was this the main opportunity? To work on so you sorry, you slightly broke up. I think the question was, um, can I talk more about what teaching was like at this time period? And I think there was a second part. Um. This is, yeah, the more about the pedagogical pedagogical relationship, uh, for example, relates to influence or genre. We've been talking about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the question there is about the transmission um, uh, of of it, you know. I mean, in a sense, I, I, I think the cafe painting is is pointing to that. Um, this, uh, but also, she's. Well, let's, 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 let's go to those ones first. I mean, you know, the teaching from the Austrian regime yeah. to the uh, post-revolution. Um, there was the Atelier, but there was also the Academy Royale, wasn't there? Yes. So um, in Paris specifically, which is sort of the center of the French art world, um, actually in the center of the sort of European art world at a certain point, um, as you say, teaching was, 
basically administered by the Royal Academy, but a lot of the teaching took place in individual artists' studios. So the kind of nature of the relationship between the professor and the student, um, it was extremely important who you study with. Um, and generally for an ambitious artist, they would try to study with a member of the Royal Academy. Um, and then this member could get them access to the so-called life drawing classes, which were the only form of schooling that was administered within the walls of the Royal Academy. So life drawing classes, so basically everything technical and, and you know, copying after, um, there, there was a great deal of copying after um, prints from um, you know the sort of major old masters, your um, Italian masters, uh, copying after uh, bronzes and busts. Um, but then all students were uh, all students that wanted to become members of the Royal Academy would go to the Royal Academy for the so-called life drawing classes, and these were studies after the live male nude, um, and basically um, really essential uh, for making history paintings, which is what everybody wanted to make. So because um, history paintings, you know, so often feature people, you know, it's, it's biblical stories or mythological stories about people and representations of often men um, and often, you know, sort of showing off one's knowledge of anatomy. And so life drawing class was pretty you know, sort of, it was essential. Now, this is also the reason why women had a hard time because it was felt that women, you know, for reasons of modesty should not be drawing after the male nude. And so uh, for women to kind of access this training as a history painter was essentially impossible. This is why many women artists became, if they became prominent, uh, they became prominent as portraitists. But this is also the reason why, for instance, that Guillard was denied studio space in the Louvre because she would have been bringing these young women in who, you know, could have wandered into a life drawing class, I guess. So um, um, it, 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 it was a sort of a structure of teaching that ended up having really far reaching implications. Um, so once you know a certain degree of training had been completed um, along these lines, artists were eligible to compete for money, um, a prize to go to Rome um, and sort of complete their training on the spot. Italy was still perceived as the kind of end all and be all of art. Um, and so going to Italy and really drawing after all of the great masters um, drawing in the Italian landscape, uh, that was really important. And then generally when they came back from, um, from Italy, they could compete for entry into the Royal Academy as um, sort of associate members. And then after a certain period and a, another couple of tests, they were received as full members into the Royal Academy. Yeah, you've turned your volume off. How long did it take for a woman to, to win the Prix de Rome? Uh, I don't think that happened to, until the 19th century, at least. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely not. It wasn't Levi Guillard or Vigée de Prome. The, the Academy Royale became um, uh, the Gold de Beaux-Arts? Yes. Um, so the Academy was disbanded during the revolution as because it was the Royal Academy. Um, and um, it ended up being uh, reconstituted um, in a couple of different forms, um, you know, under the revolution, uh, opening it up to sort of a much greater, um, the, so the salon exhibitions were opened up to a much greater um, audience. And suddenly all of these people and portraitists, um, people that hadn't been able to observe it in the... Sorry, I'm hearing a lot of echo, so I keep pausing. Your sound is off.
Make your sound as off. Sorry. Adina, can you mute your, you've got two screens up and one uh, mic that's unmuted. I think that's what's given us the background noise. Can you mute your mic? Or Amber, can you mute Adina's mic? No, no one there. We'll have to struggle on. Okay. Um, um, I'm sorry, I think it's, I'm, I'm muting everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. So, um, what were we saying? Yeah, so the Academy um, was essentially disbanded as everybody knew it under the revolution. Um, briefly kind of made more democratic because there was a period at which, because it was disbanded and you know see, received as being associated with sort of royal and elitist privilege, um, suddenly the exhibition that the Royal Academy administered, the, the so-called Salon, um, was open to everybody. And so, you know, suddenly there was this flood of new um, participants in exhibitions, obviously. So in 1791, um, for instance, it became quite, you know, sort of uh, large. Um, by 1793, it sort of slightly reduced because obviously there was um, the terror um, at that time. Um, but post revolution, sort of under the Directoire, under Napoleon, uh, conditions actually didn't necessarily improve for women artists. Um, there was a sort of increased um, conservatism, I would say. Um, and um, so there was a kind of, under the revolution, there's this brief moment when um, there's this sort of democratization, egalitarian you know, feeling. Um, but under the Directoire, um, the sort of traditional uh, divide between, you know, and the kind of exiling women to the more sort of domestic sphere and particularly in terms of those who wanted to practice professionally um, was resumed and, you know, even sort of more codified. Can we, can we go to, because uh, the second part of, well, there's three parts to Alice's question. The second part is about pedagogical, pedagogical relationships, influence or genre. In the cafe painting, um, it's, it's, there's an interpretation that's very, very much in defense of the academic tradition as, in a sense, laid down by the um, could you Could you talk about what that tradition was? Um, so I think that it relates to the sort of hierarchy of genres that I mentioned um, previously with history painting and the idea of, you know, sort of painting that had a narrative or intellectual component being really at the sort of top of the heap. And in order to achieve that, um, the need to go to, to the need to study human anatomy, um, specifically the life class. Um, Vian, who was, you know, really a kind of major protagonist of the Royal Academy, um, very successful in the Ancien Regime, um, you know, responsible for educating some of the major history painters subsequently of the 1780s, uh, David, Bien, uh, David Vincent, you know, and so forth. Um, he really was kind of, I think a real, um, he really was a sort of leading light, if you will, of, of tradition of, um, education, this ideal of history painting. Um, so I think that in this painting, um, by showing him being honored, which I think is sort of the case, you know, he is very much a focal point of this work. Um, I guess there is a certain nostalgia here um, that, it's interesting, it sits kind of in an interesting way with, um, you know, because at the same time we have this studio space that's quite, um, it, everybody seems to be really sort of enjoying themselves or in these little conversations, it's this very sociable space. And I see it as this sort of celebration of a kind of new order. 
because most of the artists represented here are fairly young. Um, Vian is one of the kind of, um, you know, venerable figures. And, um, but I think in a way they're all sort of looking up to him, maybe looking back in a way. Um, and definitely I, I do see this as a painting that upholds that kind of very traditional hierarchy of genres, which, um, you know, I think yeah, I think it's it's quite very much at the heart of the work. So, so really, La, La Bia Guiar's um, whole enterprise is is, is about um, gaining recognition within both both regimes, in a sense. I mean, yeah. one could, uh, one could argue it, was, it had become what well, quite conservative by eighteen oh eight, or yeah. How, how, um, I think, well, I mean, so she's an interesting figure in that um, because, so she had quite, you know, as we said, she had quite aristocratic ties um, in the 1780s and leading up to the revolution. And she really, she, I mean, her career was very much predicated on painting these really kind of large scale works like the portrait of Madame Adelaide. Um, however, unlike, unlike, La, unlike Vigée Le Brun, who you know, was the artist that she was always compared to, she stayed in France during the revolution and chose not to flee. Um, Vigée Le Brun emigrated um, in 1789, basically, so quite early on. Um, but La Vie Guillard, by staying, you know, she sort of witnessed either many of her patrons either go to the guillotine or um, emigrate in their own right, including Madame Adelaide and Madame Victoire. Um, she, um, because she supported. She, she, she kind of, she supported a very sort of um, moderate, but still, you know, at the, in the context of things, um, a sort of revolutionary group, a, a group of, politically, she was part of the, um, she was an advocate for a constitutional monarchy. Um, and saw members of that group um, who she portrayed in the early days of the revolution um, she saw them, you know, go to the guillotine themselves. Um, so by this time, or by the time of her death, she was kind of left with no one to advocate for her politically because her initial patrons, all very aristocratic, saw her as having kind of gone over to the wrong side. Um, but then, you know, the sort of, I mean, the sort of people that really saw the revolution through saw her as kind of very, you know, more to the center or to the right. So um, I think in terms of her legacy, it has made things complicated for her. You know, it's very easy for us when we think of someone like Vichy de Prem, oh, she's the painter to Marie Antoinette. It's very easy to say that or to think that, you know, and it's such an easy story and it's very clear. Whereas La Guillard, what are her politics? They, you know, sort of, they shift. And I think that that makes the story a little bit less, it's less seductive in a way. I mean, you know, like someone like David, um, it's very clear what he thought, you know, when, so it's it's the art and the life are completely kind of in sync, whereas for Levi Guillard, I mean, you know, in a way, it's it's more human. She's a sort of normal person just trying to get through this, you know, what was a sort of extreme situation. But um, it makes it, I think, less clear. Um, it certainly made it less clear in the nineteenth century, and um, yeah. We just go on. I mean, I've got two more questions. Uh, uh to be uh, asked, and well, one coming from Alison Green gets the last part of her question, and she's pointing something out that I think is very important, that Cafe and Carol, um, as you pointed out in the essay, are from working class backgrounds, whereas yeah. uh, Guillaume is from um, uh, a bourgeois mm -hmm. background. 
I think. Yeah. Uh, um, and you know, there's, a, there's a contrast in their clothing and the self-portrait. And also, I think, in reference to the way Alison put it in an earlier question, um, you know, women artists work in, in the household of an artist. Um, I mean, especially that with that contrast of clothing there. Is there more you can say about about that, especially in the relationship to the education of artists, women artists in this time? Yeah, I mean, I think that generally speaking for artists at, at this time period in the 1780s, it was pretty unusual for anyone to become an artist if they didn't already have some kind of family entree into the field, um, and all the more so for women. Um, so, I mean, I keep bringing up Vijay, but it's, it is a good counterpoint. She, her father was a pastelist. And I think it was just sort of, you know, that she grew up in the milieu and her husband, uh, this is Vijay Le Prime, her husband was a major art dealer. And again, that opened a lot of doors because so much of this world, you know, um, was really, and especially with a, organization like the Royal Academy, which is kind of simultaneously bureaucratic and very elitist. Um, so much is um, decided on the basis of who you know. Um, so yeah, I, it's a very good point. I mean, for Kepe and Kerho, um, they are both, um, I mean, neither of them from Paris. Um, uh, Kerho is Swiss um, from a, a farmers, a farming family, and Capé um, is the daughter of a, of a servant from Lyon. And so that, what that means is both of them came to Paris essentially to, you know, make their way, which I think there's something really kind of amazing about that at this time period. And, you know, that they found their way into La Biquiar's studio. And I think that maybe that also contributed to uh, the sense that um, La Biquiar was really you know, taking these people in, taking them into her home and her and her life, and this very kind of emotional relationship that develops, which you know I don't think is necessarily the case for all student-teacher relationships at this time period. But um, you know, she really did kind of serve as a mother figure, I think, for them. Um, in terms of their, sorry. So this was a very particular relationship. It, it, it can't really be generalized in that sense. You think? I would, I would say so. Um, yeah, I would, I would say so. We've got another question, which is an interesting one. It's coming from uh, Jack Somerville, uh, who's um, he's asking: Is was Le B. Guiar, Was she in league with Jellica Kaufman, who is a direct? Uh, contemporary, is there a relationship there at all? No, there is no, um, there's no evidence of a, a relationship. Um, I don't know the extent to which either would have been aware of the other's work, but Reynolds, um, with whom Kaufman was obviously close, did come to Paris. Um, although I think maybe a bit before Le Biguiar really sort of came into her own. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure of that. She, she was very much working in different cities and um, yeah. so it's a, the international networks weren't meshing in so closely. I suppose between London and France at the time, yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was not an easy time, was it? Well, I mean, it's definitely possible because there was a kind of, um, I think in both cities, there was a real interest in, you know, there was a buzz around these women. They're unusual. They're women and they're professional artists. And, um, you know, the, so I think I could, I, I'm sure that they knew of each other. I just don't know the extent to which they're, they were really kind of responding in one work to the work of another. Um, I'm not sure how much they're um, their compositions were circulating, but I think, you know, definitely they were all being written up in the press extensively as, you know, these sort of really interesting figures, even if it was in a negative sense, even, you know, there's, 
people weren't necessarily so nice about these women. Um, and, you know, I think um, La Biguiar was putting yourself out there as a professional woman artist at this time um, was not an easy thing to do, but they were all written about. And I guess, you know, maybe no press is bad press. <laughs> so they, I mean, their reputation certainly would have traveled. Unless, thank you very much, Eureka. I, I don't, is there any other questions? Have I, have I got all the questions um, that are hanging around? They're all gone now. Well, thank you very much, Eureka. That's thank you. To talk about these um, these paintings, and especially because this painting is is very much the um, the catalyst for for an amazing context. Is there any exhibitions planned around these artists or this context or? Well as I said, I mean, pre-COVID, there have been, there were plans um, uh, between American and French institutions were talking about a, an exhibition dedicated to La Vie Guillard. Um, there was recently a major monographic show on Vigée Le Crom um, in Paris and in New York and um, Ottawa. And so certainly, you know, it's, it's, it would be great to see something on La Guillard. She certainly deserves it. Um, and if that exhibition does go ahead, then I, I, it would be wonderful to see Capé's painting um, as part of that show. I think it would just be astounding to see the two works together. But I, you know, I don't know what their checklist looks like. <laughs> um. Alison's uh, saying to me, why, flagging up why this painting is interesting for the art school project. Um, I mean, I suppose I should ask you, why, why did you, why did you choose it specifically, Eureka? Oh, um, why did I choose it? Uh, well, Amber is um, kindly invited me to be a part of this and suggested this painting, um, which I was very happy to. Uh, write about because um, it's one that I was, it was great to have the opportunity to think about it in more detail. Um, in terms of your project, I guess, um, maybe Amber, you'll, you'll jump in, but for me, I think it's a painting that's very much about um, teaching. It's about this idea of transmission of knowledge. Um, it's Absolutely. about the close relationships between these, you know, very accomplished artists in their own right. And, um, yeah, and one of the first one of the first thoughts that we'd had when we set up the art school project, particularly because well, this is happening online, but a lot of art teaching is happening online, um, including at Central St. Martins. Um, and one of the themes that we were particularly interested in when we chose the first selection of paintings was the intimacy of of learning and and whether or not that can translate across formats for teaching. Um, was was interesting to us. Um, and I think that from Eureka's essay and also, and more so from, from the discussion that we've just had, um, I have just, we, we've, I think we've just discovered that there's, there's so much more of the intimacy of learning in this painting than you would even have seen mm -hmm. from first looking at it. Um, so much about the relationships involved and how complex they can be um, and yeah, I think this this painting, along with the uh, Chardin painting that we discussed a few weeks ago, in particular, address address that idea. I think the um, other thing is, I think the complexest for me, the, the this period is extraordinary, and um, especially because the, the 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 earlier part of the eighteenth century is, is incredible as well in France. I'm, I'm thinking. But it also what you get laid down is uh, the structure of the academy, then its transition into the, the salon system, um, the whole notion of state patronage coming through. Mm. But um, to go back to Alison's earlier question, this, this sense of the pedagogy 
the Atelier system, the, the Atelier system that, uh, in a sense, stabilised during the 19th century in the in the, in the art schools, which is still actually how the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris pretty much functions, and it's a lot of how major European schools do function. So there's a, there's a kind of DNA in all, all of that, and uh, which I think is really quite fascinating. Um, uh, I think that's a very good reason to bring this painting, but also to sort of see, um, to sort of revisit how uh, a, a major character, a major woman artist like Nabi Griais is faring at that point, especially that snapshot just before the revolution mm. is extraordinary. Yeah. And thanks very much, Rico, for choosing it for that, I think. Yeah. Um, I've had it flagged um, up as well. Angelica Kaufman is at the RA to get in. I think the RA is back do. open again. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for that, Jack. Thank you, yeah. I think unless we have any other questions, um, I'll just say thank you so much, Eureka, for joining us. That was a really yeah. wonderful discussion. And thank you, Mick. Um, and our next event will not be at the same time next week. It will be 